Hey, hey, everybody. Happy Wine Wednesday. Sorry we're running a little late. We were having so much fun in the uh, before party. No, it's my fault. You guys know this. <laughs> Anyhow, um, hope your day and week has gone fantastic. Hope you are got your glass of wine or are going to pull up with us and, and have a little chat. It's just open chat tonight. So I know I do want to show, um, discuss something from last week. Um, somebody, I, I'll tell you in a minute. I'm going to stop mumbling over my words. If you're on Instagram, just a reminder, um, you, it'll look funny, but you can always listen. If you want to see the video portion, jump on over to YouTube and under Seahorse Whisperer, you'll see us right there. Um, and I don't see any comments from Instagram either. So if you make them, I'm not ignoring you. I apologize. Um, still haven't figured that part out. Okay. So anyways, happy Wine Wednesday. I'm sipping on Chardonnay. Trying to take it easy tonight. I do still have my awesome seahorse glass from Holly. I just don't use it because I don't want to break it. And yeah, so I realized too, my AirPods aren't even working. So I'm going to take them out. Hey, seahorse corner. How are you doing? Okay. So we all have stories or stuff to chat about today. I do have to pick up my daughter at 10. So I'm going to cut everybody off then before then. But um, I, ha I have a story and I want to tell it first so I don't forget to tell it because I always forget to tell my stories. But this one scared me. Okay. You know how in a previous episode, I'm sorry, I'm trying to do five things at once. Sorry, guys. So in a previous, hey, RG Reef, thanks so much for the super chat. Mwah. And it's going great. I hope you're good too. Jump in if you want. Okay. So for I'm going to stop rambling now. So for my story. Remember, remember a few wine Wednesdays ago, we were talking about medications or something, and I pulled out my big old bottle of formalin, formaldehyde. It was actually, form, it wasn't even formalin, it was, it was called formaldehyde. I got the right kind, Dan said, it was like this big, big as my head almost, and I was showing you guys, and I was talking about it. Well, when I went to put it back, I wasn't being careful, and so I put it back on the top of this um, shelving unit that I keep all my fish crap in, and I put it on the top instead of putting it back in its place, and the other day... I was sipping on a little wine and doing my water change. In fact, I think it was last Wednesday after Wine Wednesday. I don't know. But anyways, I was sipping on some wine. I was a little, little buzzed, and I was doing a water change. That's something, just please don't do that. <laughs> don't drink while you do your water changes, first off. Not a good <laughs> plan. But I was, and I, let, I accidentally bumped the shelf, okay, and boom, the formula, uh, formaldehyde, however you want to say it, the dangerous stuff, the cat busted off. I couldn't get to it quickly enough. So like I got, I, when I picked it up, half of it was still there, but the other entire half was on my floor going up under my washer. I was, so I'm my dumbass. Oh, excuse my language, but my silly head, I immediately think I don't want my kids to, to inhale this stuff. You know, if anybody doesn't know, seahorse keepers use formalin or formaldehyde on fry and in just certain situations as a medication to treat. But you don't want, you're supposed to wear gloves with it. Some people even suggest eye goggles. You don't want to inhale it. You don't want to touch it. None of this stuff. <clears throat> but my first inclination was, well, shit, my kids will be up in the morning and I don't want them to breathe it. So I got a towel, got down on my hands and knees and this stuff, and I didn't even think about it because I'm thinking of my kids. This stuff is just burning my throat my nose, my eyes. It was terrible. And it went up under my washer and dryer because that's my fish rooms. Anyways, so I'm trying to like push the towel up under there. I got, I got it as good as I could. I threw the towel in the washer, bleached it. So, I, you know, whatever. And then I still, you could not walk into that room. And I'm thinking, oh, will it hurt the seahorses even? It's in the air. It's, it's everywhere. It's, you can't walk in the room. And the next morning, I and I got a fan out. And I was trying to fan it out the door and stuff because of my windows. We have really bad ventilation. This is part of the reason I know I'm rambling, but this is a part of the reason that I have to have such good skimmers and have to run sometimes airline outside because my windows don't open. They're like sealed shut, right? Don't know what we do in a fire. But so I opened the back door and fanning it out. I, I cleaned it up. I washed the towel. The next morning, the, and I didn't want to call Dan because it was like three in the morning. The next morning, the girls came out and they said, my eyes are stinging. And I was like, oh, shit. And I was like, stay out of this room. Get out. You can't be in here. And I finally called Dan. And the reason I'm telling this long, rambling story is because he helped me so much. I didn't even think about it. Actually, before I tell you the re resolution, Ray, what would you do in that situation if you accidentally spilled a whole bottle of formula? Well, once I cleaned up as much as I could get at, uh, I would, uh, like you're talking about getting under a dryer or washing machine or something. I'd be flushing well under that as well, um, and be damned about uh, 
what's below it or anything. Was it a cement floor or? No, it's tiled. It's I wasn't worried. I, well, I didn't even think about that, right? I didn't even think about it going seeping in, but uh, it was tiled. But well, Holly, you got any to think? Because when Dan told me what to do, I was like, oh, duh. I didn't even think of it though. There's you, a neutralizer, anybody, but I can't remember what it is. Well, would, could you sprinkle like cat litter or something on it to see how to absorb it? I don't know. Anybody in the comment section, what would you do? Hi, Tyen. I mean, not that I do that because like I don't have any cat litter. Like Wait, baking you soda or something like yeah, that. Yeah, baking soda, something to absorb. Is. Here's the answer, and it's Dan's answer for everything. Hydrogen peroxide. It neutralizes it instantly. He oh, said wow. he used to have to use it when he was, you know, like when they would do their uh, mm -hmm. entire fish room full of fry and they'd be dosing formalin in all the tanks. He said even dosing it all in all those tanks, it start you'd start smelling it. You can smell it mm -hmm. and it's getting in your eyes and stuff. And he said he would spray hydrogen peroxide the next morning everywhere and be great. It. And see, Heather, you're right. Formalin will gas off, but and I'm not sciencey guys, so I can't tell you how the h2o the o drops off and and adds to the o I, he tried to explain it all to me and i was just like tell me what to do and so like <laughs> i had hydrogen peroxide spray i sprayed it all over i sprayed it in the air i sprayed it everywhere and it was instantly better it was like a miracle i couldn't believe it so it yeah seahorses are okay everybody's okay family's okay so if you ever have trouble and you stupidly spill some uh formalin peroxide it i mean clean it up first but yeah you know. but that doesn't really look to see if there's any white residue in it i did i you no know, there wasn't it was <laughs> I had just no, no. <laughs> yeah no i threw it out i i actually asked him how to dispose of it too because you're not supposed yeah. to throw it away in a trash can. hey cruz what are you doing long time no see hey, hey. Well, i would wonder yeah so if you wash a towel I mean, does it wash away or is it gonna always be like is the towels contaminated or it actually washes out and cruz is mr peroxide too so he could he could school us on this also <laughs> but no as heather said um the formalin or formaldehyde is a gas so it's gonna yeah. like if i had just left it alone it might have taken a couple of days but it's gonna go away once it dries, so it went away in the towels though when you washed the towels they ended up okay they're not contaminated. when i washed well, first I washed, oh, Cruz, I hate hearing that. I'll ha I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to message you when we're done here. But And jump in if you want. If anybody needs the link, just let me know and message me. Um, and Tyan, you're welcome too. It's just open chat today. But you no, know, with the towel, what I first did, like I just wanted the smell to go, so I bleached it. And then I was thinking I didn't want to open the washer because I was like, I wonder how that reacts. You know, I wonder if it reacts with each other. But Dan said, no, you're fine. But just to be safe, I... Um, just the towel, nothing else, but washed it with peroxide to make mm -hmm. sure that it was, because I guess it like D, like, I'm not science, you guys. Anybody who can explain it in the comment, comments, comments. Dilution is a solution many times. Huh? Dilution is a solution many times. Right. But mm -hmm. it, it, it some something about peroxide and formalin, it makes it not work anymore. It makes it not potent the anymore. Extra oxygen. Yep. Yes. You're right, Ray. It is the extra oxygen. So anyways, I did that. And um, then I washed it with just regular Tide and it was fine. It's been fine. I still, he, he did say, you know, I was like, do I need to go to the hospital? Because, you know, people worry so much about, for, you know, formalin. And I was like, I was really up in my face and, you know, I couldn't even breathe. And he was like, but are you okay now? And I was like, yeah, I, I still have tightness in the chest and I still have like a kind of a sore throat and my eyes, like every once in a while feel burning. And he said, you know, if you can't breathe, go to the hospital, but all they're going to do is give you oxygen. They can't do anything for you. There's nothing, there's no fix. So if you can't breathe, go, they'll give you oxygen. If not, then just make sure you tell the doctor. So I do have an appointment next week. I'm going to tell her cause you know, it, it is supposedly cancer causing. From yeah. the research that I did years ago, uh, it's not one-time occurrences that uh, end up causing the cancer. Oh. Uh, the cancer is usually found with people that were working with it all the time. All the like time. A lot, of, uh, a lot of people working in pet stores had problems because they were using the formalin uh, to sterilize the nets so that using from one tank to another uh, not to transfer things 
And because they'd be using it day in and day out uh, for a year or more, depending on how long they're working there, then that long-term exposure is what uh, is ending up causing the cancer. So for you to have uh, a one-time uh, exposure like that, you shouldn't have to worry. Good. I, th I think I, I think you've told me that before, and I'm sure you're right. And and Dan made me feel a lot better because he said anybody who's worked with fish long term has had that happen. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. if you're in fact, Heather, have you ever had it happen? I'm curious. And as Cruz said, it, neutral, um, it oxidized oxidate oxidation reduces formalin. R.G. Reef said it neutralizes it. And before I forget, um, if you're not a member of Tyann's Tank Talk with Tyann group, get on over there. If you need her, if you need a uh, an invite, let us know. We'll invite you. She does a really cool live stream every week too, and it's just on Facebook though. But um, 7 p.m. tomorrow, 7 p.m. CST. I'm EST. What does that mean for me? What time yeah. is that for me? Is it the same? It's. I believe that's four o'clock. Five o'clock my time. I'll look it up. Yes, three hours, three hours after Eastern. Okay, well, I'll, I'll make sure I'm gonna go for sure because um, she does a great job and they're talking foods. So, and she breeds clownfish, so it's kind of good for just about anybody. Oh, Cheryl's popping in. Hey, Cheryl, how are you? Hi, Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Hi. Hello. Been a busy day. Yeah, we were just. I was just telling him, uh, Cheryl that. You'll probably, I just want to, I'm going to, I'm not going to tell the whole story again, but I want to see if you know the answer right off the bat. Long story short, I dumped half a bottle, huge bottle of formaldehyde or formalin on my floor and it, I got down and I was trying to clean it up. What would you use to clean it up? Okay. What are you trying to clean up? <laughs> formalin. formalin. Uh, you could go in with panic here. That's that's another idea. Dan told me peroxide, and it worked like a charm. I can't. Yeah, I couldn't really that would think work of it. too. But and um, Heather, you said seat down on the wood floors. Oh, 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 man. Okay, so Seymour uh, Corner said. Oh, she um, dropped a bottle of Prime. She said took a few weeks for the smell to go away. Oh yeah, ba bacteria. And it was I'm okay. I use Chloramex and it's powder. Yeah. You just sweep it up if I drop it. Prime does stink, but I'm telling you, um, Heather, that formalin was terrible and it was stinky. And oh my gosh, it was just awful. I felt so stupid. Don't ever drop your formalin, but if you do, use peroxide. It clears it up right like that. And there's Robert. Hey, Robert. Um, guys, I uh, apparently my char chambers are on the way. So you'd be looking for that. I'll, be, of course, bring them on live and show you guys what I've done with them. But I'll probably try to do some videos with it, too. So can't wait to get them and uh, play with them and find some new things. And I, I think Robert told me that so, uh, someone with seahorses actually ordered one and, and seeded the tank with it. I won't speak for him. But you guys know you can jump in. Just open chat. Say whatever you want. But um, Cheryl, anything new with your seahorses? Uh, not really. I've just been really, really busy today. I found out I had a problem with my eyes. Right. And I may have to have surgery. So that's what I've been doing most of today. Gotcha. Well, I, I'm praying for you. You already know that. And uh, let us know how it goes. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you're here, though, because um, I've got to pull it up. So let's let's talk with Holly real quick or Ray while I pull this up. But the gentleman that we talked with a week or two ago um, about the seahorse that's stomach just stayed big. He sent me pictures and a video and it was very interesting to me because it's more of his, like his whole chest and belly are all big. It's almost, it's, I'll show you, but Holly, while I'm pulling that up, how are you doing? What's new with you? I'm, I'm doing great. I just got a new iPhone 13 pro. Nice. So I plan on taking some great seahorse pictures with it. It's got a built-in macro lens. It's it's designed for um, low lighting. It has a special setting for that. So I can get good pictures while they're waking up in the morning. And so I'm excited about that. I've been using 
a combination of two iPhones. This is my oldest one. This is was an iPhone 7 that I've had for a long time. And I made the mistake of upgrading to this phone, an iPhone SE, probably about eight months ago or so. And the guy that sold it to me, I should say it was a kid. He really didn't explain to me much about the phone. So I assumed it was going to be better than the one I had. Well, it turned out to not have as much storage on it, although it had a faster processor. So what happened was I was unable to transfer everything from my old phone to the new one. And then not only that, but the storage got full within like a week because I take so many pictures. And then it wouldn't um, update itself. So I started having all these crazy issues. I had to carry around two phones and it, it was just a pain in the butt. So, well, I was telling you, Sean has the 13 Pro. And he loves it. And I'm, I'm still here, guys. And my nice, kids are just coming nice. in and out. So I'm trying not to make you. Yeah. Watch so me. this one, it has one TB of memory, which is the biggest memory you can get. <laughs> so I'm hoping it's going to last me hopefully five years or so. And I'm sick of fooling around with phones. Is it, <laughs> is it 5G compatible? Yes. Yeah. It's their newest. It's their newest yeah. phone. I was just saying if it's not yeah, 5G, so I, you're screwed. Well, I don't have 5G where I live, though. We don't have any 5G towers. Yeah, so that part is not going to matter here. But when I'm when I'm traveling, like if I'm in the city or something, I can get 5G. Yeah. But up here, we're not we're not that technical yet. Right? <laughs> well, but Ray made a great comment before we started, and mm -hmm. um, he said, "You guys are you all you people with all your phones. <laughs> We're gonna be screwed if if you know. We won't mention any countries, but if anybody knocked our electric grid and we didn't have, and our phones didn't work, well, whew. I still do things the old fashioned way too, though. Yeah, because I did live in the days before we had cell phones or even home computers." So I do have an old fashioned address book with people's names and phone numbers in it. I well, have my old cabinets full of paper still. I do it all the ways now. I want all my bases covered. <laughs> right. Well, and Cruz said connect it to the iCloud, and this is totally random. We're getting back to seahorses and other channels. Oh, seconds, yeah. But, but Cruz, I, I'm just curious. I have maximum I storage on iCloud, too. I'm I have to pay for too. extra. I have 52,000 pictures on my phone. It's ridiculous. No, About 40,000 are of the seahorses too. But <laughs> what I'm going to say is my son okay. called me last night and he was telling me about this um, podcast between Joe Rogan and, um, oh my gosh, what's Elon Musk. And it was from 2018, but he was talking about literally drilling a hole in his skull using this technology stuff. And it would literally be like taking all your memories, all your, Everything that makes you besides your soul, obviously, uh, no. my point, and oh, putting geez. it up in a cloud and like so that you could. And I was and I said, well, that would be kind of like my mom passed and it was really terrible <laughs> for all of us. And I was like, uh -huh. you know, if she could when I'm sad, if I could turn her on, you know, <laughs> and oh, he wow. was like, no, that's creepy. That's creepy. That no, is no. creepy. <laughs> so, that um, is creepy. OK. All right, I, Holly, I don't want to cut you off. Was there anything else with the seahorses or anything? Because I've got a question. The and seahorses are doing great. The K1 still cycling, so it's still in that nitrite cycle right now, but it's it's going down. Yeah, you know? so, so we're still weeks out. Um, I lost my goby for a week. I, I was worried that he was dead because he's over four years old now, so I know he's getting right about lifespan for a goby, I guess. And I hadn't seen him in a while, but he showed up yesterday and today because he'll do that, you know, and I had pulled some rocks out last week. So maybe he had to build some new tunnels or, or you know, rearrange oh, yeah. landscape. So he disappeared for a while, but, but I he's back. So I was stoked. I don't know if anybody else, I mean, anybody who does other fish besides seahorses, 
ever lose a fish once in a while and wonder if they might be dead somewhere. Yeah. Uh, just a quick note for you guys that don't know him. He Cruz has come on the show before, but it's been years back. Um, but he was my reef tank mentor. So he's the one that taught me how to reef, helped me when I had problems, helped me figure out how to get rid of algae. He has the answers for everything reef. But I remember calling him one day and saying, oh, my gosh, Cruz, I've lost this rest. It's gone. And and I think I think it ha I had a. I know I've had peppermint shrimp too. I've had like three or four fish that just disappeared and mm -hmm. it would be like, there's no body. I don't know where they are. Yeah. And then I'd find them in the sump or I'd, you know, they'd mm -hmm. all of a sudden be there one day. I don't know. Sneaky little fish. I think <laughs> I, specific I, fish found, do that though. I found a young female engines that I got from Dan years ago. Could not find her anywhere in the tank. I'm scrambling. I'm taking out everything, including the other seahorse. She was in the sump. She was in the sump? <laughs> how did she get Don't there? Don't ask me how she got there. I still had the sponges up, everything secured. But I finally found her after like over an hour of searching everything. Well, she was in the sump. Well, and that's my big fear, like when you lose a fish or something. And I, and Aphrodite, actually, my seahorse from Holly, yeah, yeah, yeah. she likes to hide. So I have to look for her sometimes. <laughs> but... When you lose a fish, though, I just feel fortunate that, like, in my reef sump, it was baffled because I'm always afraid of, my goodness, if they get sucked in the pump, they're going to be fish food all of a sudden, <laughs> right? Yeah. But anyways. Well, in it, my take, they got to end up in the sock, you know, if they come out of the <laughs> tank, unless they jump out somehow, they're going to be in the sock. Well, yeah. and that's... And that's why when, when I've, we've discussed for weeks and weeks how I'm so ticked off at my seahorses because they keep pretending they're pregnant or getting, you know, the male pretends he's mm -hmm. pregnant and then there's nothing. The girl gets fat. He gets fat then after they've danced. She, she, there's no eggs anywhere and there's no fry. And I have socks. So it's not like, and it's an all-in-one. So there's uh -huh. nowhere they could go. But Cheryl told yeah. me they're just playing with me. Okay, let's get to some questions real quick. Laura said... Has anyone used Vibrant in your tank to help with algae? Not for algae. I would use uh, MIC uh, F, the probiotics, to reduce the organics that are creating the algae. Either that or put up, uh, build a uh, basically an algae scrubber for the tank, or cut back on your lighting. That will also help. So, I mean, there's several different ways to do it. Yeah, Laura, um, I would say, first of all, so glad Cruz is here. Cruz, <laughs> what would you suggest? Maybe microbubbling? If you don't know about that, it's on Elegant Coral's page. Uh, I can link that when we're done. Um, Vibrant, I did try it. I actually started a video series on it, but then I had a catastrophe in the tank, and it wouldn't have been fair to continue with the experiment because, you know, there was all these other things happening. I can't even remember what the catastrophe was, but... It was like it wouldn't be fair to finish my seven day trial or whatever because it, you know, because of every, all the other things that occurred. Um, but I did do the first video on it. I've heard, I've heard literally 50 50 on Vibrant. 50% of people say it's a miracle worker, 50% say it's it's nothing. If I mean, I don't, it won't hurt a seahorse tank, put it that way. Yeah. I don't think it hurts anything. My guess is it's some sort of um, bacteria, probiotic peroxide kind of thing. The thing that I like to use for, um, it, the other thing is it depends on the type of, um, nuisance algae you're dealing with. I totally agree with Cheryl, um, on my big seahorse tank, Ronald Chinners built me a really cool algae scrubber. I've got a video about it somewhere, but it's like hand, it's unique to my tank, but algae scrubbers work in the sump. If you have a sump, um, I, I like to use peroxide now. That's the main thing I use now is peroxide. And I remember Cruz had me use peroxide in my reef when I had algae. But he, mm -hmm. I did a lot of different things with Cruz. But do you guys, and what do you do? Peroxide's right? cheaper, too. Huh? Peroxide's cheaper. Yeah, it is. And if you squirt the algae with peroxide, depending on the type, depends on the type, of course. But, man, it turns white in my case. Yeah. I, I, feel like the, I still like the MICF. Uh, right. Biotics. That's still, you can put it in, it does not mess with your water parameters. And you can, stuff you can't test for, you can visually observe. And you can put that in there. 
and in a matter of hours, you're seeing uneaten food going bye bye. Right, but with with Mike F, isn't that something like that? I I use it, but I always use that before I have a problem. I didn't. Yeah. I've never heard anybody say to use it to solve the problem. Does it? It can. Okay. I tried it for years, and this was back uh, oh, more than a decade ago. I don't know if anybody is old enough to remember the Sano Wars, um, but back in those that era there, I started using McF, and uh, uh, I'm trying to think, probably for about a year and a half, best I can recall. I never saw any difference in any of my tanks with it or without it. Really? So I just quit using them. Well, I know I, I definitely I have, still have some. As a matter of fact, so it would be kind of stale now. Well, I use it mainly in my fry tanks, but I did use it on the big tank because I kept having a recurring problem where one male, just one, would keep getting tail bubbles, um, uh, gas bubble disease. Um, and he just, he would get the problem. I'd fix him. I'd put him back after, you know, a long quarantine period where I treated him and he'd get it again. And none of the others were. And as Ray will tell me right now, there's something wrong with the tank. You need to clean it up. There's, you gotta, you're, you've got too many organics, bigger skimmer, something, whatever. But I'm telling you, I had a skimmer rated three times the tank. I had an algae scrubber. I had macros in the tank and he just, this seahorse just kept getting it. Uh, and, yeah. um, so I started using Mike F in that tank and it could have been something else. I can't say that's what did it, but he never got it again. So I don't know. You're right, Ray. You're right. A lot of us old timers have never, ever used any of those things. Yeah. Right. And what Cruz is saying uh, for going back to algae is drive off any excess CO2 and detrit detritus. I can never say that, that the algae depends on. Absolutely. Clean it up and, um, like in that case, like, do you have a huge skimmer, um, and micro bubbling? It, I'm telling you that works too. That's mm -hmm. what saves yeah. my reef. And then Holly, um, I, hi Holly. I see you're here. Good cleanup crew too. Turbo snails are awesome for that. And Holly, I think you asked an algae question probably a year ago, but I'm curious mm -hmm. what ended up working for you because with turbo snails and such, Ray always points out. They clean it up, but they're pooping it right back out. So <laughs> okay. Well, so Kelly, Kelly, one thing I'd like to bring up real quick. Wait, 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 wait. That tank. Okay, Holly first, go. So I said, so nothing's worked for me so far. I'm in the process of switching out that tank. So it'll be more like my other one, you know, all fake stuff. So I don't have to deal with all the live rock and all the stuff that gets trapped in it. You know, it's going to be it's going to be a different, more fake stuff like my other well, tank. I yeah. do agree Hold with on you. Minute, guys. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you bring it up, but I just want to comment on Holly's comment. I do yeah. agree with you on that. I've never had algae problems in uh, completely artificial tanks, but mm -hmm. it's because I scrubbed them down. You know, I scrub the bottom. I scrub everything, every water change. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, Cheryl. Uh, this one after oh, two. What I was going to say. Grab off. It's got coralline algae that I can't reach because there's a hood on the top of the tank. And I'm going to have to, you know, tear it down and scrub it with peroxide and and just redo it. Yeah. Well, the hood might be. Well, it sounds like, Cruz, we need you to to get feeling tip top shape and come back and do another micro bubble um, episode because we haven't talked about that in a long time. Cheryl, you go ahead. You've been waiting to speak. Okay. Go ahead. Well, one thing I want to say is I know a very reputable breeder that was at this for many years. And this individual raised some tiger tail seahorses. What she ran into is not only did the male who was wild caught have a uh, pouch emphysema, but most of the male fry that he produced. In fact, she, it reached the point that she euthanized all the males and donated the females to an aquarium. And this was not, it, it was, just, there was too much. It could not have been the tank. There had to be a genetic predisposition associated with this. So just because you're looking at something doesn't necessarily mean that you know the cause of it. No, I agree. I agree with you. I think Ray is right uh, that it's usually organics, 
But there are cases like that male, he didn't get better until I was putting probiotics in the tank. So maybe it was something bacterial. I don't know. Something genetic, like you said. I, I don't know. But um, Well, she ended up euthanizing that male because he had consistent recurrent pouch hypocema. I kept the male that she sent me alive for several years. But I could do a pouch evax on him two, three, four times. Then he'd produce some fry. And then he'd go back to the same problem. And th this was a tank that I knew really well. And I knew it wasn't the tank. And right. Well, I trust it, was, it when you say it. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was one of those things that was, and people say there's no genetic predisposition for this. Well, there may be a gene, something on the genome that is creates a dysfunctional problem. Right. I mean, we got piebalds. There, there's something goes on with some seahorses sometimes, you know. Yeah. We don't. Yeah. Okay. Next one. Um, cause I definitely want to make sure if, if you're in the audience, oh gosh, I'm so bad with names. Um, if you are in the audience, um, geez, I can't even find his name now. Sorry, Danny, Danny, if you're in the audience, I promise you, we are going to get to your seahorse, um, and discuss it. I absolutely promise. But what, uh, Waylon asked a question. Are there any disadvantages of using one sump for the fry system and the parent's tank? Uh, fry system would be a tub. The return line to the fry tub will go through a UV sterilizer. So you're saying, so what, using, what, I'm trying to understand it. Um, you, of using one sump for the fry system, like out of the parent's tank? Is that what you're oh, saying? Like the parent's using tank? the same sump for both the parents and the fry. No, oh. don't do it. Yeah, don't do it? Don't do it. Okay, why? You need to keep those parents set complete, the mm -hmm. adult tank completely separate from the fry. Because what's going to happen is whether you're feeding brine shrimp or copepods or whatever, you're throwing a massive amount of food into that nursery system. Mm -hmm. You're also uh, cleaning it constantly so there's nothing left in there. The adult tank, on the other hand, is getting what cr krill... Uh, Mice, mice shrimp, shrimp right. things like that. It's a completely different food source and it's a completely different ecosystem that you're dealing with. I typically, when I have a nursery going, it gets cleaned at least three times a day. I mean, top, bottom, etc. My adults, the, the uh, everything gets uh, sucked off at least once a day. And there's a big difference in there in terms of what's sitting there mm -hmm. and what what's growing there. Yeah, we, we always say that um, attaching a seahorse tank to a reef tank is problematic because of the temperature. But I like all of Cheryl's comments. And I was, you know, thinking about it as we read the question, I was thinking, well, I guess blah, 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 but she's right. And, and just thinking about ciliates or anything that's yeah. in the adult tank that the fry can't handle, you know, cause and if you have to treat the fry for ciliates with formalin, do you really want it going into the do, adult Do you thing? want that? Do you want yeah, that? Yeah, you're exchanging all their stuff both but ways. The, but wait, with the UV sterilizer in between, wouldn't that kill anything? I still like Cheryl's answer about the foods, but. The thing is, the you're going only to keep gonna, the tank sterile. It's yeah, not going to. The is only going to kill what goes through it. Gotcha. Yeah. Not, not everything goes through it. True. Exactly. Well, but he's talking about having it literally go through it. You know, between the tanks, I think. <laughs> I think. Anyways, no, no, don't do it. That's the answer. Well, she <laughs> has uh, fry that uh, came out, and they may have ciliates attached from when uh, you know being birthed in the original tank, and you put them into this other tank, then that's the start of a source of ciliate growth in there, and yes. uh, it's not going to pass through the UV to be killed off anyway. You're contaminating other tanks when you start mixing. But I will say, and uh, Tyann and Robert, if you're still in here, um, I'm curious if that, what you, how you would answer that question if it was clownfish, because I know you separate the fry there too. I can't wait to learn more about clownfish. But, oh gosh, what was I going to say? I was going to say something. I started rambling and it's gone. Ah, uh, dang it. Oh, what I was going to say is, if you guys remind me when I'm done, I will link the video that Cheryl did with me about her fry tubs. And I, I understand, uh, Wayland, that you're just you're basically trying to do more with what you got in, in the space. That's I'm all about that. But Cheryl will do like um, her. What was in the other tub? Was it 
was it Artemia? What did you have in the other tub? Oh, uh, amphipods. Amphipods. So she would have two tubs, one sunk. And if she didn't have two tubs worth of fry, she would use the other fry for amphipods or, you know, that kind of thing. So you can work it out to where you're using the space more efficiently because I get it. Setting yeah. up a sump for a fry tank is, is a pain right. in the booth while. Well, one thing I like about doing two nursery tubs in a <laughs> sump is it enables, gives me several things. One, it enables me to move the fry from one side to the other so I can thoroughly clean the tub that they were in if it starts getting a little messy. The other thing that it gives me is a larger area. Uh, I can move larger, more dominant individuals into one of the other tubs. And the thing is, I'm not changing their pH or specific gravity, any of their water parameters. Mm -hmm. And it gives me the ability to grade them and to carefully select who I'm going to move into the larger grow out tanks after that. My larger grow out tanks are 58 gallons with 30 gallon sumps. My nursery systems are two 20 gallon nursery tubs with a 30 gallon sump. And again, it comes back to filtration obviously um, there's a million and one things but it's one of those things where i find it much easier i i can have a whole brood of erectus mm -hmm. and all of a sudden i'm getting maybe getting ciliates or i'm seeing a, a big uh, build up of detritus for whatever reason all i have to do is just net them move them to the other side takes me five minutes to clean the other side and refill it. That is a good point too. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, sorry, go ahead. It's not, it's just not a big deal. Well, but it is a big deal. I was trying to say this. I was trying to be devil's advocate over here. It is a big deal if you don't have the space or you don't yeah. have, you know, you don't have the time or knowledge to set it up. That's why we made the videos to show how Cheryl set it up and explain everything. So I will link it when we're done. Um, but I don't think it's a bad idea to try things like that. Um, I'm glad you asked so we can help you not make the mistake, but when you try something and it works, get your, get, come on back in here and tell us about it for sure. And well, just, I know we're, go ahead. It's, it's different for everybody too. I have my way of doing things. Ray has his way. Holly yeah. has her way. We all have found ways and they're not necessarily identical, but they're similar that work for us based on our job requirements, you know, kids, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And Absolutely. I think that's part of the important thing is being able to balance the seahorses with family, friends, etc. And that's very important. And guys, I know I'm jumping around on the questions. I apologize. I just I have the comments. I got to get to them as I do. But um, just back to the nuisance algae, Laura. I really want to know what type it is, if you know, or send me a picture and I can put it up on the screen. But RG Reef. Um, RG Reef said, find the source of the excess nutrient excess of nutrients causing the algae yeah. and more frequent smaller water changes is the best for the uh, fox or algae, in my opinion. Not enough flow, too much food at once. Right. That's the problem we talk about all the time, uh, even when it's um, specific to seahorses, is it's so hard to answer a question because we have to ask 20 questions before we can answer the question, you know, mm -hmm. because... What's your system? What does it even have a sum? Do you have a skimmer? While we're talking about algae, I have another quick algae thing to bring up. Okay. I'm curious. It's your about. fault. You did it. You saw your fault. No, she didn't. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> she knows me uh, too well. <laughs> so I have this bag of live sand. It's Carib Sea or the Fiji Pink. It's got a, a best buy date of February of 2023. But I had bought it for when I switched out the sand on my tank last year. Remember right. when I switched to sand? Yep. Okay, so I have this bag left. And I was thinking, you know, when I pull the live rock, I'm going to put new sand down and stuff. But then I noticed, I don't know if you can see in the bag. See how it's got weird, like, neon green, like algae mm -hmm. in it? What is if that? If it's been sitting there warm, it's going to grow algae. Because yes. it's got live stuff in it, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you're well, going to use it, cold, I would. Actually. <laughs> yeah, if you, you're going to put it in a tank. Uh, well, that's would, what I'm asking. Is it usable at all? I'd, run it, I'd run it through a uh, H2O2 treatment 
bleach it, spin it, and rinse it multiple times, and then accept the fact that you're going to have to go back in because you're not going to have any biofiltration on it. You're going to have to add... Uh, well, at this point, I say it's just easier to buy new bags of sand. <laughs> yeah. Because it looks like... once That's you start what, green, what happened it, was yeah. I bought too many, so I'd have enough. And then COVID happened and it wasn't returnable because yep. Petco yep. stopped taking returns due to COVID during that time. And then they started again, but it, now it's been so long, it's not returnable. I'm so. saying you take it back and be like, you sold me a bad bat. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, it probably has a date on it though. It does, yeah. but it's next year. It's well, a it's year probably, from now. Well, as Cheryl said, was it possibly sitting somewhere where it got warm? Or? Well, it was more cold than warm, warm here, but right. it, where it, got yeah, warm, it, was it sat through the winter. You know, mm -hmm. it sat through the winter, and it's like, well, the water, I store the water in this room, and the water is 55 degrees. Huh. Interesting. So uh, you got a cold water green algae. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's that, it. Is that why it's neon green? It's a color I've never seen algae be. Well, that's the that's the color that is in my um the overflow boxes though with the yeah. grow out tank. It grows really, really bright green. Yeah. And it did you and, and that tank doesn't have sand though, right? No, it has okay. nothing. It's bare bottom, but fake stuff. But remember, in the overflow boxes, they're so narrow. Right. The only things I can fit in there is like a bottle brush, and it right. does not do a good enough job cleaning out right. the algae. I would have to disconnect them, break them down, and clean. See, but them. you know what? It's when I think about that, though, if it's not clogging anything, like if I had, no. I, I'm just hypothetical here. If I had a tank. And as it, long and as the I the for sponges. Well, no, listen, if I had a tank and the overflow box was filled with algae, but it did not for some reason spread to the sump or the tank, mm -hmm. I'm like, that's filtration. Well, it's like an algae scrubber. <laughs> Shit. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just ugly, but I have to rinse their sponges over the outgoing, you know, where it goes down right. into the sump. And I have to remember, which I've, forgot today when I did the tank cleaning to I have to remember to take them out and rinse them because they do get kind of clogged but, okay. but as long as I do that it's it's just ugly but they're just a pain well I have a I'm going to get to Laura's question but I do have a question based on your question Holly so do you do you does anyone in the audience who uses sand in your seahorse or reef tank with the carob sea, the whole benefit to it is supposed to be that it has live bacteria and, you know, what you can just use it and it's going to help you cycle the tank, supposedly. So I'm curious, do you guys rinse the sand or do you buy into, not, I mean, do you, does it work I, for you? To I use am totally tea? bare bottom. I, I know. I'm, I'm asking anybody who when uses I added it. The other sand, I used it straight from the bag live and it was great. I had no problems with it. No algae problems? No. Huh. Okay. No, it, it was fine. Ray, I want to, I want your answer. I still, real quick. To this day, my sand has no algae. It's the dumb rocks. <laughs> right. Right. Well, I had a tank that I used sand in my breed eye tank, and I got this terrible, the sand that I used, and it was carob uh -huh. This is why I'm asking, because mm -hmm. I used it straight. I didn't rinse it. And then I got this terrible black, it looked like black feathers yeah. coming out of the sand. It was just black fuzzy shit stuff everywhere. It was terrible. I hated it. I ended up taking the sand out. But Ray, my question was, they sell this sand, Carib C, that the benefit is that there's live bacteria in it. So it's like watery. It's like in water in the bag. Would you rinse that? Or would you think, because it's supposed to say. Why would you ask the wrong guy? Because <laughs> you don't use sand. Yeah. I, I would. I, if it has black. I have no it, use for sand. Even I uh, when I started uh, reefing uh, many decades ago, uh, I started off uh, not using sand, but I was using aragonite. And uh, the last one I basically used was uh, I had a, a pre filtered reverse flow under gravel filter setup that I was experimenting with. 
Ray, Thank you're you know. dating yourself. Yes, you are. <laughs> uh, that but it works. Last, but that's the last that uh, I use. I had a, a partial setup one time uh, because I had some mackerel. And what I did is I had a baking dish that I took out of my wife's cupboard. And uh, I put that in it and put uh, the substrate in it so I could put uh, the mackerel into it. But uh, as far as the tank goes, it was Berlin method all the way, uh, all my tanks. Funny. Okay, well, moving on. Uh, Laura wants to know, um, is there table? Is there a table of certain amounts of Mike F that you should use? She has a 43-gallon 40, tank. I have a table um, that Dan created. I will try to link it when we're done. Please remind me. It's also, I think, in Seahorse Sources group on Facebook. And it says on the back of the container, right? I mean, I always ask Dan anyways, but it tells you on the back of the container what to use. Don't make me go grab it. <laughs> let me go see if I can find it. But um, while I go to find it, let me see if there's another question. Robert uh, said my char chambers are on the way. Whoa! If you're add, adding lime sand to oh. an existing tank, you really need to rinse it first and pour off all the excess debris. And then you can add it in without a lot of problems. Otherwise, you're going to turn that tank the existing tank into a big cloud yeah don't don't overuse my gaff i did in a fry tub and it was yeah. spider webs it looked like halloween everywhere oh, yeah. sorry go ahead sure. and see the thing is like when i build my sumps i build them the, the uh basically individual chambers the smaller ones at least two inches wide and i fill them with live rock small live rock and coral skeletons. So I'm running a massive amount of biofiltration without the hassles of using sand, which is what mm -hmm. sand also does. Is they, they provide this, basically the same structure for bacterial growth. But the difference is I don't have to clean up sand. I don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and then, um, I'm trying to jump through these comments. Sorry, guys, but Holly, I, I hate that you had to tear down that tank. I hate, hate that we couldn't help you figure it out or you couldn't figure it out. Well, it's, you had to restart, for but. Me, it's hard to maintain the live rock because I can't clean in it, really. Right. And it's hard to take out, you know, because I've got the big hood on the darn thing. You no, know, it, it's I just need to make it easier and better for myself. So, you yeah. know, I just need to trade it out and but it's not totally starting over yeah, really I just right. need to really clean the tank because the sump's been going i mean the tank's over four years old now and you've and got I'm the bio just, balls and now you have the k1 yeah, i don't have a k1 to rubble add rock, to, yeah. to that chamber and the rebel rocks for the amphipods right, right. Loving it, it. by the way i saw them out exploring it the other day it was warm for a little bit and they were out and about and Good. Yeah, they're doing well, good. Well, one thing I, you guys saw the, the stuff that I did where I took small pieces of rock and drilled holes in them and mounted artificial corals in them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I was concerned that they were going to collect a lot of detritus and crap. In reality, all I have to do is use, I can literally use my fingers or a net and move them over. And they're so easy to keep clean. I thought they were, that was my big concern was that they were going to collect too much crap. Mm -hmm. They don't do it because I'm running the, the power heads in there, which blows everything off of them. Mm -hmm. Right. That's mm -hmm. what RG Reef just said. Microbubbling is a great way to remove excess nutrients, but so is having the right amount of flow in the right places. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, need to, we need to like do some, a wine Wednesday where we all show our flow or whatever, because well, I, use a flow. I use a circular flow. So I everything that, that gets, mm -hmm. you go high, to low to lower back up high and mm -hmm. it's constantly moving and then uh i mean th these are reef ready tanks so it's basically filtered from the bottom so what i want everything to do is gradually circle from the top down to the bottom and right out through the stand pipes right absolutely cheryl but everybody doesn't have a tub right and like a lot well, of i want to use that pre-filter that ray told me about you know that's got the thing that comes down so you're yeah. sucking stuff from the bottom instead of the top i need to get one of those 
I like well, that. I think we still need to have Cruz and maybe RG Reef come in and and let's do a because Laura just asked, isn't micro bubbling bad for seahorses? Absolutely not. And Cruz said, um, not when they're fine. There are a lot mm -hmm. of um, yeah, exactly. They're bubbles where they're found. I, I worry about that all the time too, Laura, though, because in the all-in-one, I had a problem where I wasn't micro bubbling, but because the pump like wasn't, I don't know, the sleeve mm -hmm. that was connecting it to the return, it's an all-in-one, so it was just in the back, but it was, there was just, there was constantly these little bubbles. With micro bubbles, you usually barely yeah, even yeah. see them, but these were bigger, like I could see them. And I was so worried, are my seahorses going to get pouch emphysema, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever. And Dan was like, no, no, no. We've proven and proven that bubbles don't hurt seahorses. They mm -hmm. literally, I've got so many videos and pictures where seahorses will literally sit in a flow of bubbles. And mm -hmm. yeah, they like, like it. Woo! Let me give Let Ray talk. He never gets stuck. <laughs> Go, Ray. I still hate micro bubbles in a seahorse tank. Why? In my opinion, if you want uh, to give extra water movement or aeration, you leave off bloody air stones. Just yes. open ended air line. And uh, exactly. the, um, the well, water motion at the for... top of the surface is going to be disturbed enough to get proper gas exchange just from those larger bubbles, mm -hmm. and you won't have near the amount of salt creep around. Like you now that's true. One, you were talking one time about the paint damage behind your tank. Yep. Drywall. Um, the more you use uh, the micro bubbles, the worse your situation is going to be on that paint. Well, to be fair, the, yeah. the paint spot that I showed you on a previous Wine Wednesday, guys, it's a, it was actually where the return was. It wasn't it it wasn't the bubbles coming back. It was. Literally, it was just the setup of my tank. It was just the setup bad. Me. But and I and I can tell you, micro bubbling works for algae. I understand you uh, don't like it for like oxygen exchange, but it it anyways. We we, we got to get uh, crews. And real real quick, Kelly. Again. Real quick, uh, I quit quit using micro bubbles in a seahorse tank. Uh, almost fifteen years ago, because I had a male that was dancing. And he'd stop and he'd go over and hitch to the airline, mm -hmm. inflate his pouch, and blow it to the top. <laughs> After his third pouch evac in roughly 15 minutes, uh, that was the last time I ever used an open Yeah, but that's airline. not, but Cheryl, that's not micro bubbling. Micro bubbling is something totally different. It's in the sump, it's not in the tank. That's true. I'll have crews come in and talk about it. Real quick, I, I, I want to go try to find the my mic F so I can read the back of it. But Holly said, is there anyone selling tiger tail seahorses? She has a male, and she would like for him to have a buddy. I'm not going to say any names, but you know who you are. Wink, wink. Um, I wouldn't be upset because I'll, I'll talk to you later. Holly, let me try to work something out for you. Um, message. Wait, so, well, Holly, if you can, so anyone that has it. You got you got a tiger tail, Holly. When did where when did you get it? Can she hear me? No. Well, yeah, she can hear you, but um, I'm gonna go try to find the mic F. Let's discuss UV sterilizers because he said a UV only works. RG Reef said a UV only works correctly when the flow rate is thorough enough and correct. Um, flow rate is correct. Sorry, running a UV after a turn pump will not have the enough contact time. Just my thoughts. Keep two separate. Wait. Um. So running a UV after a return pump will not have enough contact. I'm just trying to think about my all one. So, so you want the? Actually, that's something that I messed up on my 65 gallon tank. So I'm so glad you pointed it out because I had the UV or the pump go into the UV and back into the tank. And Kevin um, of Mazna actually came on one time and said, "Dummy, that's not how you're supposed to do it." So. Why don't you guys say your thoughts on UV real quick while I grab the mic up? Well, from my point of view, uh, if you're wanting it to control uh, bacteria, which is the biggest problem with seahorse tanks, it will not kill most of the bacteria that uh, are affecting our seahorse tanks because yep. those bacteria are benthic, not pelagic. They're on surfaces. They do not go through the water column that will not go through the UV. Uh, they're great yeah, for cool. looking after uh, uh, algae blooms and that kind of thing. Uh, 
if you do have uh, pelagic uh, parasites of any kind, then it's great for that. But uh, speaking primarily for the uh, seahorse uh, hobby, though, it's in uh, adult tanks. I don't see a need for it unless you're going to use it to kill off an algae bloom. Uh, fry tanks are a different matter. Uh, I believe uh, if you have it on a fry tank, then uh, you have an advantage uh, for killing off uh, ciliates. Yeah, the, the biggest thing is uh, I, I use, when I have UVs, and I had, do have some on my tanks, uh, they are in the sump. They're not in the main tank, first of all. So they're pulling out stuff that's going through a 100 micron filter sock, et cetera, et cetera, before it gets to them. The other thing is, as Ray already said, they are advantageous for removing ciliates, and they can even be beneficial in an adult tank if you have a, a ciliate infestation. Are we still talking UV sterilizers? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because I was going to say, as you guys know, and I saw Cruz had to go, Mwah. I'm going to message Cruz, try to get him in here for a video. But um, with the UV, everybody told me I didn't, I didn't need the UV sterilizer in the all-in-one. But it's a smaller tank, no sump. I'm trying to do more cleaning, as Ray suggested. But I noticed... When I turned that UV sterilizer off, within four days, and this is after a huge water change, within four days, the female was doing the scratching on the rock. Not her gills, but her mm -hmm. sides. She was mm -hmm. like leaning over. And I'm trying to show, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to be a source. I'm not here. But she would lean over and scratch the side of her body on rocks. I turned the UV sterilizer back on. No more. Yeah, exactly. It's on. It is doing something. They're great. For, they're great for getting rid of ciliates, which is a common problem with seahorses. And it, they can get rid of algae. I don't know what you guys said while I was gone, but they can absolutely help with algae. It's just what RG Reef said. You've got to have the right flow going into it. It has yeah. to be right, or it's not going to do anything. The, the I biggest still problem. Is, the old method of solve the problem. I know, Ray, but we can't all be awesome like you, okay? <laughs> Newcomb? You don't have to be awesome. It's just, it takes a little bit of uh, work, that's all. Okay, and this generation's lazy. Anyways, but what, Cheryl? <laughs> well, I, I was just going to say, the thing with the uh, UV is it works really well for things like ciliates. And you, depending on how you adjust the flow, it may work for uh, al algal blooms and stuff like that. The pro biggest problem is the really good ones are very expensive, yeah. and the cheap ones only last a couple of years. So it's very expensive to keep buying them and adding them in. Or replacing the lights. And again, like the UV sterilizer that I bought, it was a cheap one, I admit it, but I had to replace the lights constantly. And I found out after like six months of using it that I didn't have enough flow going into it. Like they don't tell you that the pump they send with it is crap or whatever, you know. Well, how do you figure out the right flow for your UV sterilizer? Oh, like, there's is a, there a way to measure it or there's a site. Should, should tell you the rate right on the uh, sterilizer. Yeah. yeah, but they don't they don't tell you how enough. How do you I control that? Does it have a, a a pump with it that controls the speed? Depends no. on you know, the sterilizer that you buy. And the sterilizer I got told me what, what they told me was not correct. So all I'm saying, I'll try to, I found a website that was really good. It was a calculator. I'll try to find it when we're done and, uh, and link it, or I'll at least send it to you, Holly. But, and Robert just kind of jumped around here, but Robert said, I have a, I have grow out and brood, and this is clownfish, not seahorses, but I have grow out and broodstock in the same system. And it can certainly be pro problematic. My larvae are in a standalone tanks with a char chamber and I'm back to hundred percent survival rate. And then Cruz, before he left, mentioned that aquachar is a great media to biologically stabilize a reef and horse system. And yeah, Cruz isn't here anymore, but my char chambers are on the way. Kevin sent me some. Robert sent me some, but Kevin donated them to the channel, and I can't wait to test them out, and I'm going to talk about it all the time. Aquachar is a sponsor. Use Seahorse Whisperer code, and you'll get 15% off your order of aquachar. And Robert also said... Um, that he just recently set up different systems for grow out. 
Um, just to let you guys know, Robert King does live streams almost daily. Um, and if so, if you're interested, I mean, we talked about this when they came on this channel a few weeks ago. Um, search that up if you want to watch it. But the crossover is incredible between breeding clownfish and breeding seahorses or just keeping them in general. The, the stuff we talk about is the same. The feeds, the cleanliness, how to keep them alive, the medications. So Tyann and Robert talk about all these on their channels too. So definitely it's worth a watch because every time I go, I learn something and then I bring it back here and talk about it with you guys. And it's just good crossover. All right. I'm done rambling. Yeah. Oh, and over then, ten, Well over 10 years ago, closer to 15 years ago, I was talking with a friend of mine was, who was one of the first people to successfully raise clowns in the U.S. And I asked her, I said, well, how would these same parameters work with seahorses? Or oh, they're completely different species. They wouldn't work at all. The parameters, yes. I'm and just I mean, saying that was the, the, back in the day. Right, and that's amazing. And I'm not saying everything's the same at all. I'm just saying like he, like Robert well, figured out that he wanted to have the fry tank separate because there can be problems. He just okay. recently set up a separate. So maybe if he had been coming to wine Wednesday a year ago, you never know. And I learn things every time I go to their streams. That's all I'm saying. Um, I'm that just saying me. that clownfish breeders were like at that point, so egotistical that they were actually able to raise some, they weren't going to admit to anything. Right. Well, I no. think since that time, uh, we have come together more on a uniform. Absolutely. Basically, building the correct nurseries yep. makes a phenomenal difference in your survival rate. And keeping your feeds clean, keeping your, and that's why we're testing the chart chamber. But no, I mean, yeah, all these things matter for sure. And I get your point, Cheryl. I didn't mean to um, yeah. go. I have to pick up my daughter at 10, so I'm kind of rushing through the comments now. But, uh, and I still have to show you guys the, the fat seahorse that we have to talk about. Well, I have friends now that are using the round circular tubs that we've been using for years with seahorse fry. They're now yeah. using them for clown propagation. Really? Very high success rates. Well, you need to get your friend to come on Wine Wednesday so we can talk about it because that'd be interesting. Maybe it would help Robert too. What well, Robert's amazing. He's already blown us away. But I'm just saying. Well, everything to, uh, improve on his 100%, you know. What? It's hard to improve on his one for hundred percent. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. huh. So why? I mean, that, bravo, bravo, yeah. right? But I'm just saying, everything well, we teach, well said, Ray. Well, said. <laughs> everything we teach each other helps both sides. Is all I meant. Okay, Waylon said I you're so. I have a question, real quick, for everybody that raises other fish, because the only fry I've raised is seahorses. So when you're raising these other fish, like the clown fish and things, how long does it take for them to grow up, you know, from being hatched to adult? Depends on how good the breeder is, what their water quality is, what they're being fed, what species they are. That, that, that's a loaded question that I can't answer. Well, and we just all need to go to Robert King's live streams and uh, tie in talk or take talk with Tyann and ask that question. Holly, you and me yeah, will go. We'll go together. Yeah, how long does it take baby fish to grow up? Right. Oh, well, and I know on women in reefing, when we had the women in reefing, the first women in reefing at MACNA a few years ago, um, Kathy Leahy um, it was the first to do a specific clownfish, reef clown, uh, not clownfish, um, not clownfish. The, I think it was the Coral Beauty angelfish one of the angelfish i'm going to say it wrong so don't quote me but she was the first to successfully uh raise these these um angelfish i love I coral beauties by yeah I, I don't know if it was coral beauty so don't quote me but she was the first to do it and she was sharing how it, and everything sounded the same cheryl she was talking about oh i figured out that i needed smaller feeds at first like some mm -hmm. of the um, seahorse species you've raised, mm -hmm. there's just so many things that overlap is mm -hmm. all I'm saying. But yeah, Way yeah, and, and yeah, Holly, exactly. we'll get your answer when we go to the live stream. Waylon wants to, or said, you're supposed to use the sand straight from the bag. Alternatively, you could clean it out in the sand in fresh, in fresh water and then use Brightwell's microbacter to seed it. Absolutely. Well, I'm going back a number of years and I had somebody, after I was using the circular tubs for seahorse fry, Flat out, I said, well, you might want to try these with your clowns. 
oh, these would never work for clowns. They're just not suitable. And I looked at her and I thought to myself, well, one more down the drain. <laughs> right. And real quick, I'm just trying to get through these comments, guys. RG Reef said cured rock and cured dry sand is the way to go, in my opinion and experience. And I'm right there with you because mm -hmm. just, you know, the times that I haven't done that, I've had problems. So I'm like, mm -hmm. if you do, you do you, whoever you are watching, if you watch later, you do you, nobody's saying you're wrong. Come share what worked for you. That's, we love to have differences, opinions. We fight sometimes. We get, I like punch Ray in the head. <laughs> but, but no, hey, Kelly, but, I have never punched you. Oh, well, you'll get there. I promise. You, many people want to punch me. I never but, punch anybody, so that's a moot point. I know. I'm kidding. He, <laughs> also <laughs> he also said that his point was, if the flow is not correct in the EV, there isn't enough contact time to kill anything. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And if it's if it's not fast enough, or if it's, yeah, it, what he said, he's right. Yeah. You have to get it perfect, yeah. or, it ha you know, it has to go through perfectly, or the things don't die. You know, you got it. Okay, That's why I'm watching the, the size of the fry, how they're developing, how they're moving. It's like when I'm working with combs, when they start coming around and hitching to the return, which is basically one of those little uh, PVC uh, gizmos that fit on, and they're able to stand, hang on to that. I know my flow is too low. Right. There are tricks. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Carol, something that everybody keeps asking in the comments and when sending me messages is they really want us to do more of showing. And I mean, we do, we all, we share so much here, but like it's so one day we need to have Holly day where, you know, Holly shares her tanks and literally she, you've done it before, Holly, I know, but I don't often tag the videos correctly or the wine Wednesdays correctly. Um, so people can't find it. So we need, and I, we need to have an episode where Holly walks us through her tanks, shows us the systems, shows us how they work. And then I'll tag it that way. So people can find it again. And Cheryl, we need you to walk us through our tubs. We can, Cheryl, you and I could even do it ahead of time because I know it's hard to do live, yeah. but I can play it live. And and Ray, I know you are you're down to one tank, but you've got old videos. We just want to see, you know, we talk all the time about, oh, well, this is how I set it up. And we say it goes through the little tubey and then da -da 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 -da, and they're like, mm -mm. <laughs> so they want to see it. So we gotta start showing it. Yeah, I, I you don't still have the videos too, Kelly. <laughs> what? I know, I know. I, videos from way back. <laughs> I am the slacker who doesn't get the videos done. I totally admit it. But that's why, you know, if we do it for a wine Wednesday, that will get done for sure. Um, well, and Spuck, go ahead, Cheryl. Just because a particular glow rate works for me or my fry, does not necessarily mean it's going to work for somebody else's. It depends on how large they are, how strong they are, what condition their parents were in. There's so many variables, and this is one of the things I look for when I'm trying to raise fry is, am I moving them too fast? Are they not strong enough yet? Do I need to cut back? Do I need to pick it up? Damn, stop hitching to the returns. Okay, well, stop making people scared. <laughs> but no, that's, my whole point, no, Cheryl, my whole point is. Yeah, it's one of those things where it takes time and to experience yep. to be able to look at what you're seeing. Yes. And to adjust things. Right. But you say that, and that's a great com comment. I agree. But if you were to, with me early or, or live, show, say, look, this guy's swimming like this, the flow's too high. This is how I know it's too, you know, you're, they can't automatically know how to do it. But seeing, okay, this guy is going, rrr, 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 so that's too <laughs> high. And this guy is like, not eating, so that's too low. Showing sometimes is better than saying. Right. This is why I tell people to find a mentor that has had right. a lot of sure. success sure. and work with them. And don't don't go blowing all over the boards. Just nope. work with that one person. Ask them, is this too high? Is this too low? Are these ready for, for frozen training, et cetera? No, I agree. Yeah. And go to Seahorse Sources Group on uh, Facebook. Come to Wine Wednesday because if you show us a video, we will answer any questions. You're, yeah. Anyone who comes is more than welcome to get a link and come join us in the video. Or as I'm going to show you in a minute, um, Danny sent me pictures and videos that I'll show for him because he didn't want to come in the video. 
and we can answer questions. It might take the next week, but if you say, does this look like it's too much flow? Does this look like it's not? We'll, we'll help you. Um, yeah. And then Spuck, Spuck Jr. wants to know whether cheap or expensive doesn't flow rate for specific critters differ as to effectiveness. Run that one by again. Uh, whether the pump is cheap or expensive, doesn't the flow rate for specific critters differ as to how effective it will be? Like for seahorses, we keep talking about they need higher yeah. flow than people think. I think I would say yes. My answer is yes. <laughs> it does matter. I agree with that. Okay. And then Sh Shyla asked. Oh, wait. RG Reef said, no, that's only important for corals. I disagree, RG. I think it does matter because people think seahorses need low flow and they need high flow, higher than they think. And like certain, like if you're talking fry, that's totally different. In a reef tank, the fish oh, will adapt, I agree. He's but. talking about the calcium and magnesium tests. He's saying, no, no, I, was, I was looking at something else, but right. Yeah. Shiloh okay. wants to know. Here's answering this one. So I've got that mic up. I'm going to come back to that. And then the fat seahorse, I promise. But um, do we test for calcium, magnesium, and alkalinity in a tank that's not going to house any corals? Oh, I'm sorry. You're right, Holly. He yeah, was he was answering that yeah. question. I got it, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I don't disagree, RG. Okay. What do you guys think? <laughs> do you test for this stuff? I agree Hello, with then. RG Reef. I don't test for that. I would only do it for corals. I don't even test for what she is testing for. <laughs> yeah, but I yeah, double check my top off water. Same program. here, but my tank's been up for a really long time. <laughs> but what do you test for yeah, those top things off? are things that corals need. They're not going to affect the seahorses, really. Yeah. But when I guess alkalinity could if it was way off. And I was going to say, if you're having algae problems in your seahorse tank, testing magnesium might have uh, be, mm -hmm. be beneficial. Mag, mag will kill off the uh, macroalgae. The problem is when you're doing that, what else is it converting the macroalgae to? And the magnesium, what's the chemical reaction? And I studied that a few years back and could never find an actual conclusion on what it was converting the chemicals to. Right. Okay. Well, Shyla, my answer is I absolutely test for ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, pH, and specific gravity when I'm setting up a tank. Like it, I usually pre-cycle my media, but then even after it's set up and I add the seahorses, I've had situations where my cycle, my media was cycled. I thought everything was good. I put the seahorses in and then Two weeks later, I had nitrites because I hadn't cycled the media enough or I, I just screwed something up. So I absolutely suggest testing for the five things you said, ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, pH, and specific gravity for the first, mm -hmm. say, month at least of a tank. And then I personally test like every, you know, if there's a problem, I test instantly. And then I also test like maybe once a month just to make sure I'm not way off on anything. I, I do it test every month or two now. I've had my tank up for four years now. And I remember right. the first year I tested it all the time. And then after that, gradually less and less. And now I rarely test it. But I I'll try to test it once a month, but it usually ends up being every couple months now. Right. But I would say I, I actually have a an issue with, I don't know if it's because of the temperature. Okay. Actually, I'm going to come back uh, and show you my face while I say this so I don't sound stupid. But when I make my water, I use a smaller bucket because I'm only doing a smaller tank right now. For the bigger mm -hmm. tank, I use a brute. But in the smaller tank, I use a smaller bucket. And the pump I have is uh, I, I'm cheap and I'm lazy and I didn't want to buy a new one. So I'm using a big old pump in this little bucket so the water heats up and mm -hmm. something about the temperature affects the specific gravity rg reef or someone else can explain the science of it but bottom mm -hmm. line is if when i even when i test specific gravity i have to let it sit for a minute on the machine on the refractometer because mm -hmm. it'll change so something about the temperature mm -hmm. or something about what i'm doing 
makes it different. So I test specific gravity every water change, every time. I test the bucket before I use the water, and then I test the tank a day later, always, because I've had huge ranges I don't do mine at all well i use the exact same salt measure because i'm using buckets right and i always use the same salt mix so i figured out it's two and an eighth cup for a bucket of water oh uh, that's <laughs> all i have that <laughs> and, 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 and out. i exactly. use a measuring cup but i still just dump it in so <laughs> but i have to heat the water some of it a portion of the water in the bucket on the stove to bring it to temperature of my tank. Ooh. And I've got that down too. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what I'm saying, but you figured it out. You figured out, it out over the time. Repeat. Whereas with me, I'm, I, I admit it guys, I'm lazy. So I'll, I'll set up, if I, if I'm getting ready to walk, do a water change and I don't have the water ready I make the water and then I kind of trust that a little bit more, but often, mm -hmm. I'll make the water and then be like, oh, I'm going to do the water change tomorrow. And then mm -hmm. it sits overnight and this pump gets it so warm. I don't, uh, somebody um, tell me what's the, why does heat affect? What, when, what, um, what ba back up. How much water goes into a five gallon? How much salt mix goes into a five gallon bucket? To, to get Two and a half cups. Two and an eighth cup. I see. I use two and a half. Depends on the specific gravity. I, I'm bringing it to 1.020. You, you well, guys actually have... measure this stuff? I just dump it in and go up. <laughs> I actually I agree. Agree. I I I agree. Agree. No, 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 girls, girls, girls. Ray, Ray gets to talk. Go, oh, Ray. I use a 30 and a 35 gallon barrel to mix my stuff in. The, yeah. the 35 I, I mix the instant ocean. The 30 I mix my homemade formula in, and yeah. I. Uh, check for specific gravity. I don't worry about temperature because the temperature basically is all in the basement. It's all the same. It's all the same. It's good yeah. and cold. And yeah. uh, I run a, a, a. But wait, wait, wait! Time out. I got a question for Ray. Hang on. Forty-five. I, I don't. I don't uh, do any okay. other testing. Okay, I've got a question for Ray though. Because are you telling me I'm nuts? Because number one, the refractive. No, I never are... tell you you're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> not to my face, right? But no, the refractometer, when you buy one, it literally says when you put the when you drop the water on the machine and you go to look in the thing, it says give it so many seconds to get to room temperature. And I'm telling you, my pump is so big it heats up the water. Well, which I let it cool that? down, but if you have a simple airline then. It won't heat yeah. it up anywhere near so much. <laughs> That's I don't idea. even use a pump. But the thing is, it, it's a normal thing for the uh, specific gravity to change. When you put that little bubble on there, it may be small, but the fact is uh, the warmer bubble is going to be larger in volume. So when it gets down to room temperature, the volume is going to be a little bit less, which will increase your reading on the the right. refractometer for the specific gravity. The thing is, I don't worry about a yeah, lot Yeah, that of went stuff. right over my head. Sorry. Anyways. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I don't well, worry anyway, about uh, stuff. You're safer uh, to wait till it gets uh, down to temperature, but I still, I I wouldn't want to heat up the water like that. Uh, I, I don't want to. Throw an airline in. I, I'm going to take yeah, your I'll advice and do it. that. And Heather said, she tests just uh, temps and salinity, and that's it for established tanks. But then Shyla said, mine is a new tank that's almost done cycling. I, and she also gets her salt mixed from an LFS. So I definitely would test. Like There's Cheryl. You, between wait, a brand wait. new tank and an established tank. First well, and I was going to ask you to just say really quickly, first of all, for anybody who watches this um, that doesn't want to do this, it's not a big deal. I don't. Nobody mm -hmm. else does. Cheryl's nuts. I just called you nuts. Just kidding. But um, Cheryl, you test your new water, right? Yes. And and why? And what do you test? Okay. Well, I, first thing I do when I test my water is I, I'm looking through what my TDS is, total dissolved sol solids. I'm also looking for any kind of c contaminants coming through, whether it be ammonia or whatever. In other words, anytime I mix, bring bring in new water, um, I 
I'm looking at my, uh, as I said, my TDS off my meters, off my RODR units. And what I want is totally pure water coming in. Mm -hmm. And from there, I've been at this long enough. I know the marks on my tubs, if I'm trying to do an 80% uh, or 8 milligrams of uh, salt mix. So I already know how much to add of whatever else I want to add. But it's one of those things where it, 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 I, 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 was, do, I wasn't trying to put you on the spot. I was just trying to show that some people do test. There's nothing wrong with testing. No. Testing is good, Shyla, especially in a new tank. And especially if you're getting your water from someone else, okay. if you're not well, mixing it. Yeah. I, I'll give so you an example. I have a quick question well, about ROVI well, for you guys that have been using it for longer than I have. Okay. Well, Holly, I, I just beg yeah. you to make it quick because I got to get to the fat seahorse. Okay. Go. Okay. I want to make it real quick. Okay. Okay. Make it real quick. So Nothing goes in one of my tanks. Until I pneumonia. Wait, you guys I, are talking, wait, shh, you guys are talking at the same time. Cheryl, finish, but quickly. Okay. Nothing goes in one of my tanks until I have tested the water that is in my top op and refills. Bottom Again, line. she's nuts. No, I'm I'm kidding. She's <laughs> careful, and that's why she never fails at seahorses. Holly, go ahead. You be. Go. Okay, so the carbon block in the RODI is for removing ammonia, right? The what? Or not removing ammonia, chlorine. It's for removing chlorine. The the carbon it, well, block portion of the RODI. There are other uh, elements as well. Yeah. Okay, so well, I have a, I it. have a question. Like um, they say, what the how to tell when to replace it. Is if there's breakthrough chlorine. Okay. Is what okay? So I found out that there is not always chlorine in my water. They don't right. always add it. Most of the time there is no chlorine. Sometimes they add like when it's raining and so, like when stuff's muddy, I think is is when they yeah. add it. So that's not always reliable for me to test because if there's no chlorine in the water going in, there's not going to be any in the water coming out. So is there another way to know when to change them out? Or do you think they'll last longer because uh, they're not Molly, getting chlorine? We, we had this conversation last year or maybe the year before. And at that point, I advise you, regardless, always test for chlorine. Because yeah, she's saying she doesn't have chlorine. Yeah, but no, I'm saying there is no chlorine in my water. Most of, so right, how right. am I going to tell when the carbon block is done? Okay, so my answer how would do I be yes or no. My answer, and Ray, you can back me up with this or or disagree, but there the you as you know, and this is why you're asking that um, it's taking out more than just chlorine. So mm -hmm. I do think it will last longer because it doesn't have to take out the chlorine but they usually have a manufacturer guideline and it usually says change every six months or every year yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So I would personally just follow it. I just wouldn't buy that. Push it. But Ray, what do you think? Generally I change it when I have to change the DI. Ah, so you wait yeah, until the DI. I prefer to do it that way. Actually, no, I do it every other time that I change the DI. Okay. I, I change I, every time I do anything with water going into a tank or coming into an RODI filter or anything else. I'm testing the water before it's going in and I'm testing it when it's going out. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything off, then I need to go back in and modify what I'm doing with my filters. Right. Bottom line. Right. For sure. Um, and yeah, we can, we can dive more into that. I hope that answered you, Holly, but I, my personal answer yeah, is so basically, follow. yeah. So it, it's been the six months, so I should just change them out. Even if I'm not detecting well, just that one, you don't have to change them all. Just that one. Oh, does it say well, change there, each of them? Well, there, I have a five. RG Reef, what are your thoughts? So I have two carbon block things in mine. Okay. And I just changed out the... The filter part, not the carbon block, but the other thing that it goes through first. And then the, um, and the DI resin. So 
the DI resin, the way I did it was there's two canisters of DI resin. So I moved the end one to the front, put new in the other one and put it in the back, uh, like they okay. say to do. And then put it in the front. Well, whichever way, I don't know what front or back, but I'm t I did it the way they said to do it. And so, and then after that shows up that it's done, when I'm getting the TDS of one again, then I replace the, uh, the other resin. I see what you know, you're doing. Resin. So I just did that. So I might as well now do the carbon blocks. Is that what you're saying, Ray? I do both the sediment and carbon at the same time. Okay. And but I'll I'll do it just uh, every other time that I change the two DIs. Gotcha. So the I'll start DIs. doing it that way then, because like I said, mm -hmm. I can't use chlorine to check because there's no chlorine in the water. Right. <laughs> well, dudes, reef dudes. Hey, reef dudes. We haven't seen you in a while. He jumped Kelly. in and said pre-filter sediment. Stupid to me. <laughs> so gotcha. One, Got it. One of the things I do <clears throat> is I'm also on a well system. And I have a one micron specifically designed carbon sediment filter. And it clogs up really fast because before it goes into anything else in my RODI unit, it's going through that filter. And it, I, I love it because it's saving me a lot of money on other filters and RODI resin and stuff. Absolutely. And I only have to change that one filter to keep everything clean. And the other filters now, since I started doing that, are lasting me six to eight months without yeah. any problems. The more you have, the more the more time you have. I'm gonna put up a few more comments, but I'm gonna cut you guys off in a second because I gotta show Daniel's uh, seahorses before we go to have a conversation about that. And I gotta pick up my daughter at 10. So um, Reef Dudes, just so glad you came. And what did you say? Let's see. Um, he said, move same the older thing one the first. Carbon every other time. He said, yeah, he move the same. older one first, new one last. You guys should yeah. check out Reef Dudes. He has lots of stuff about this. It's, he has great videos and they're tagged correctly so you can mm -hmm. actually find them. Okay. I hope I got all the comments, but I'm going to have to go to showing Daniel Seahorse because I really want you guys to see it. Thank you, uh, Ray, for the reminder to do that. So Reef Dude That's said it the way I was trying to. <laughs> That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> okay, I, I hit something that's taking too long now. Hang on. Let's see if we can get it. I'm hanging on. I know. I'm taking a minute. So sorry. My computer's okay. saying you've been yapping too long, Kelly. Time to go get your kid. It's Kelly's fault. So I, I know. It always is. Okay, so here's the seahorse. Do you guys see the seahorse? Which yes. One? See a couple, yeah. Okay, oh, the I one is upper, up high. Do you see huh? how fat he looks? Yes. What is that, Cheryl? What is that, Ray? Looks closer to an abdominalis. Uh, I, I was think there's some large erectus in there. The male to the right, though, is huge. Right, and that he was saying that his pouch always stays full, but it's not really that. It's that he's a fat. His whole body is in inflated. <laughs> That's the way like. my abdominals are all the time. Yeah. So Ray, do you think it's fine? He's just a fatty. Well, I've never experienced it other than the abs, so I don't know. This is an erectus, I'm assuming, eh? I have seen erectus that big. I've seen a big erectus, but I've never seen it with. Uh, a chest and uh, exactly and lower body. Never seen it uh, bulge that much. Yeah, and the the lower one on the left uh, it could be a female, but it is significantly smaller. It, it's a little hard to say for sure. Uh, can we get some pictures? Like he sent me a video. I will post. I will show that in a second. But what I'm here's my theory, and it's just a theory. But I think that at, we've talked about seahorses have different personalities, different, you know, we have piebalds, we have genetic stuff that goes on. I think that this particular seahorse is just shaped this way. Like that's how his genetics worked out. I still think he can, I mean, he has had fry, right, Daniel? I think you said he has. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I don't think he's staying fat. I think he's a fatty, which is not a bad thing. <laughs> I want a fat mm -hmm. boy seahorse. <laughs> it means he's healthy. 
I mean, he looks healthy. He looks happy. He doesn't look bloated. It looks like that's his shape is my mm -hmm. thoughts. But let me go over to the video now if I can. Maybe my computer's not being helpful. Okay, here he is. Now this um, angle. That is good. not. There's a pie ball. There's an orange in there. Uh, okay, but we're looking at the we're looking at the boy that comes out at first with the fat pouch. Okay, I had when I a few years after I started keeping seahorses, uh, Draco Marine Jorge Gomez Gerardo sent me an extremely large bright silver male, and I'm talking over eight inches. Looked very similar to this male. I mean, he was huge. But fat like that, I, I'm, I'm waiting for it to yeah. replay. Sorry, but when he, when you, when it first starts over, when it loops, this look, look at his pouch. I'm looking at it. It looked like a football. Yeah. <laughs> yep. no, I've never seen a pouch, or I've never seen an erectus uh, with that body shape. Daniel, I'm curious. Are are these all erectus or claimed to be erectus? No. I, I think they are. But they're beautiful. My God, that's yeah, beautiful. Look at them all. <laughs> I'm like that. Oh my gosh, I love it. How big is this tank, Daniel? I love it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can. Uh, if I get rid of this, maybe it'll be bigger. I'm just gonna keep letting it play because it's freaking beautiful. <laughs> yeah, he's just huge. But it looks to me, it's, it's his whole body. He's just yeah. Thick. I think yeah. he's just thick. Well, I just wanted to get your guys' uh, thoughts on it because, you know, that's it's what we do here on Wednesday. not exhibiting any sign of a problem, and I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, I have seen Erectus get that large. But does he seem short to you? I know I, I, I can't, like, replay it until it loops, sorry. But we get to look at the beautiful seahorses while we watch it. Mm -hmm. And I love this tank, my God. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. The gorks. Oh, I love it. Looks like my old tank. I miss it. But when it restarts, I just uh, I just feel like he's shorter and fatter, which is fine. Well, it's hard to uh, I can show you tell him shorter because when he has the uh, the larger shape on the body, it would tend to make him look like he's shorter. Gotcha. So unless you could see it uh, side by side with another one the same age, uh, it's pretty hard to tell. But we did. It's right here. They sure like him. Look at they they're going for rides. They all I know. But I mean <laughs> you can take I'll start the video again. Kelly, I can I can show I you think, males. I think it's a totally different body shape. Yeah. And uh I don't see anything uh saying short to me. Well, there's nothing wrong with the seahorse, is my point. Yeah, I agree. Okay. We're going to watch it one more time just because I love it. <laughs> so pretty. If it's something like a hereditary throwback or something, well. That's what I think. Um, I, again, it's not something to worry about. But I would be curious, Daniel. I know you've had one batch of fry. I, if you ever raise any, and we can help you with that if you need it. doesn't look like you need much help. looks like you're taking care of seahorses quite well. but um, And we want to see more of them. Love for you to join one week and, and come in and chat with us, but, um, about, oh my gosh, just, oh, I'm just, I'm so, I'm like, have baby seahorses. I need a full tank again. That's so cool. <laughs> and, and look at that, look at that orange and white one. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, that's a beautiful the the same way, then you know it's hereditary. Yes. I was going to say, I'm sorry. Thank you, Ray, for getting me back on track. If you ever raise the fry, we'd see if it's, you know, if it's a genetic or hereditary thing, or if it's just him and his specialty. And I do want to know, I've are these all erectus? And I, it, you guys, I hope you're noticing his, his tank's full of coral and macro. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. So we need to get you in here, Daniel. You need to come be a guest. Damn it. <laughs> I, I've seen both combs and erectus at least that size and even longer. Uh, and they're, they're not living in coral reefs or anything else. They, I've seen some really huge males. 
Well, yeah. And Chen Threefer, hello. I'm sorry I didn't say hello to you, but he said it's the Danny DeVito of seahorses. Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Okay. We're coming on. I've got I've got to leave by 10.05, guys. So we've got a 10-minute warning here. But um, Daniel, I'm going to message you and see if you maybe want to join us next week and come in and share your tank and share all your seahorses because I want to know how big that tank is. I had in my 90 gallon, I had probably, I can't even remember so many growing out fry, but they were still small. And, you know, I still, it was not as beautiful as this in my 65 gallon. I probably had too many seahorses, but they did well, but this looks like a huge tank. You've got other fish in there um, and you've got coral. So you're showing us that it can be done and we want to talk to you. And hear how it's going for you. So I'm going to quit playing your video. Don't copyright me. <laughs> but anyways, all right, here we are back. But no, that's awesome. And nothing's wrong with your seahorse. It's if he's not floating and the girls all mm -hmm. like him and he's already had one back <laughs> to fry, he's fine. He's probably the pick of the litter. <laughs> the Danny DeVito, right? He's Danny DeVito seahorse. I don't know, Gail, so we'll talk in another week. Love you, Ray. Thanks for coming. Right. Good night. Good night, Ray. Good night. I'm going to go to bed too after my. Okay, Cheryl. Absolutely. I didn't. I wasn't smacking my leg because you. I was just thinking since Reef Dudes at, um, is here, I can't believe I didn't mention this before Ray left. Ray has seahorses in Canada that he would like to rehome because it's too much work for him. So I haven't talked to you in a while. But Devin, if you're interested still in trying seahorses, I, I'm sorry I haven't kept up with you. Maybe you already have. But if you're interested, he's looking to rehome seahorses. And I mentioned you, and I said I was going to reach out to you, and I never did. So mm -hmm. I'm uh, reaching out is, now. Are these his pots or his barbs? He, uh, he, I believe they're the pots. I believe. He, Holly, do you remember? I think he only they're, has pots. They would be. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure they're. they're, they're uh, I can't believe I didn't say it while you're here. Sure yeah, I think, I think what the Dominalis is the only ones he has left, I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, I Devin, now that I've said it live, I will message you on the side because if you're still interested, you do a good job and get the word out about seahorses. Don't, don't say Abdominalis. Walk up to a first guy and say, I raised pots and he's going to think you're using. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I actually had that happen in real life. He goes, he finally goes, what do you think when I say pots? I say pots and pans. Andrea, you saw Danny's tank on Alyssa's page and it was over 300 gallon. Yeah. Awesome. We got to get him in here and have him share mm -hmm. some more yeah. because he was just worried about this particular seahorse, but that's an amazing tank. And yeah. that's always been the key. See, this is what I always say, guys is that we come on this channel and we say, okay, here's the guidelines. If you're setting up for a seahorse tank and you're in an apartment or, you know, you only want a small tank, you got to do at least 30 gallons. You got to do this, that, and the other skimmer. But if you want coral and stuff, if you're willing to do a 300 gallon tank, hell yeah, you can have coral. Oh, That's yeah. different. The more water volume, the more you can do. Every tank's different. And I can't wait to have him in here. And uh, Dev and I will. But guys, I am going to different when your eyes don't focus at all like mine aren't right now. I know, Cheryl, we, we pray for <laughs> yeah, your right. Yeah, but I am going to have to it. I'm going to have to call it for tonight, guys, because I have to go get my daughter. Good but night. hey, Devin, Jim, RG Reef, Cruz, everybody that came tonight, we appreciate you. It's so much fun when we all get in here and talk about all topics. But mm -hmm. I will message you afterwards and. I hope everybody has an amazing happy wine Wednesday. Everybody say cheers. I gotta end it. Gotta go get the kid. We'll be back next week. Cheers.